On 12 October, 1941, the Supreme Command of the Ground Forces of the Wehrmacht issued Directive No. 1571 Fraction 41, which referred to the Center Army Group. The Fuhrer decided that Moscow's capitulation should not be expected, even if it is offered by the enemy. In Kyiv, the explosions of slow-acting mines caused serious consequences for the troops, in Moscow and Leningrad it should be expected even more. You should also expect the danger of the plague. Therefore, no German soldier should enter these cities. Anyone from the population who tries to leave the city to our lines must be shot. Before capturing these cities, they must be destroyed by artillery fire and bomber aircraft, and the population must be given the opportunity to leave. The chaos in Russia will increase, and the use of the areas we occupy will become easier if more and more people move inland. This order was issued when the troops of Army Group Center began Operation Typhoon to capture Moscow and inflicted a crushing defeat on three fronts of the Red Army near Vyazhma and Bryansk. This is stated in a separate issue of our channel, where we offered, 20,000 likes, and we are preparing a continuation of the topic, the battle for Moscow. Today we have more than 22,000 likes and more than 200,000 views. So, today we will find out why Hitler never captured the capital of the Soviet Union. Greetings, friends. My name is Vladlan Muraev, you are on the History Without Myths channel where we talk about the past of Ukraine and the world without embellishments and falsification. Subscribe to History Without Myths and click the bell so you don't miss our new videos. May Ukrainian YouTube flourish. It seemed that in the first half of October, the road to Moscow was almost open to the Germans. Even modern Russian historians consider it a miracle that the Nazis did not capture Moscow already then. What happened? First of all, let's not forget that the encirclement of huge groups of Soviet troops did not mean their complete destruction. I whole formations and individual units continued to fight desperately, trying to escape from the grip of the enemy. Many of the members of the Bryansk Front succeeded in this. The Germans had to commit significant forces in order to prevent new breakthroughs and eventually eliminate the pockets, and these forces consisted mainly of mechanized units which were a symbol of the Blitzkrieg, now instead of moving forward quickly, they had to turn back and squeeze the rings of the surrounded troops of the USSR. For example, the commander of Army Group Center Fyodor von Bock wrote in his diary on the 8th and 12th of October. The liquidation of the Bryansk pocket is progressing very slowly. Guderian can't advance yet, just like Weichs, the second army, can't. He is busy liquidating the Bryansk pocket. A significant problem for the Germans turned out to be stretched communications and shortcomings of the logistics system. The volume of railway transportation from the deep rear turned out to be too small, and this led to a chain of problems related to the transfer of supplies and providing the troops with everything they needed. It also turned out that there were few roads in the Soviet Union, and all of them were of terrible quality. Even in good weather, there were situations when all roads, more or less suitable for the advancement of mechanized connections, were filled with troops. This made the maneuvering of forces and the delivery of supplies much more difficult or impossible. It got really bad when the rains started and the roads became acidic. For example, the commander of the 3rd Tank Group Hermann Goth described the situation after his troops captured Kalinin, now the city of Tver, on October 14. But after that, the enemy had an ally who managed to do what, despite all the sacrifices, the Soviet command could not achieve. It was not the Russian winter, but the autumn rains that put an end to the German offensive. It rained day and night, rain fell continuously interspersed with snow. The roads were soaked and traffic came to a standstill. Lack of ammunition, fuel and food determined the tactical and operational situation of the next three weeks. You can find many similar statements in the memoirs of Germans of various ranks. Soviet and Russian historians are skeptical about the influence of weather on the development of events. Thus, one of the leading experts on this issue, Alexei Izaev, claims that roadlessness did not have a particular impact. For example, at night the mud froze over and even cars could safely drive on it.
In my opinion, this is purely cabinet manipulation. The very fact that the roads could be traveled only at night shows the significant influence of the weather on the mobility of the Wehrmacht, and then you can easily imagine what those trips were like. At night, with light masking, along solid potholes, even if frozen. At the same time, Russian historians pay attention to how the Red Army was drowning in the mud. During the retreat, the units left not only the stuck trucks, but even the T-34 tanks, which had excellent cross-country ability. They even made a joke in the spirit of Stalin, if General Mudd fought on our side, he should have been shot for treason. Therefore, it cannot be that one party suffers from the vagaries of the weather, and the other does not notice them at all. The Soviet command tried to delay the advance of the enemy by all means. The attacks on the mechanized formations of the Wehrmacht involved not only the strike forces of frontline aviation, but also long-range bombers. These were not typical tasks for the crews, their training involved actions from great heights, at night, on stationary targets, and here they had to look for mobile armored vehicles, descend almost to ground level, fly during the day, and often without fighter cover. As a result, huge losses. For example, on October 18th, it was possible to collect 108 long-range aircraft for raids, of which 19 did not return to their airfields. That's 18%. That is, five more days at this rate, and there would be nothing left of those hundred planes. The Mosai defense line would have to hold back the troops of Army Group Center. It stretched for more than 220 kilometers, from the Moscow Sea, as the Volga Reservoir was called, in the north, to the confluence of the Ogre and Oka rivers in the south. It included four fortified areas, within which almost 300 concrete firing points and almost half a thousand earthen ones were built. But in general, the fortification works were completed only by 40%. In many places there were not even trenches. The defense was occupied by the troops of the Western Front, whose commander was recently Georgi Zhukov. After the defeat near Vyazhma, the formation of new units and formations of the front actually took place during hostilities. Units that broke out of the encirclement, cadets of military schools, and the Moscow militia were involved in this. Several fresh military units also managed to arrive. The 316th Rifle Division of General Ivan Panfilov arrived from near Novgorod, and the 312th Rifle Division of Colonel Oleksandr Nauma from the Voldai region. 14 rifle divisions, 16 tank brigades and more than 40 artillery regiments were transferred from the reserve of the main command to dangerous areas. Many of them were incomplete, and this was sorely lacking. For example, according to the charter, the division in defense was supposed to occupy a section of the front 8 to 12 kilometers long, and it was necessary to defend more than 40. But resistance to the Wehrmacht troops intensified. This was especially successful where the Red Army could occupy well-prepared positions. For example, near Malo Yaroslavets in the area of the village of Alinsk, the cadets of the Podolsky Artillery School, led by Colonel Ivan Strelbitsky, who came from a Cossack noble family known since the time of Galicia Valen Rus, defended themselves. They occupied a line reinforced by reinforced concrete bunkers and equipped with anti-tank artillery. The Germans could not take it immediately. Then a column of tanks made a bypass maneuver and on the 16th of October attacked from the rear. But unexpectedly, they jumped into an anti-aircraft position with two 88mm guns. Cadet calculations, 19-20-year-old boys, were not confused and deployed their anti-aircraft guns. Twelve tanks were destroyed and several more damaged by direct fire in a fast-moving battle. The cadets held their positions for about a week. Those who remained alive retreated and took up defense at New Frontiers. Near Malo Yaroslavets, the 9th Tank Brigade, commanded by Ivan Kirikenko, from Cherkasy, also distinguished itself. It had about 2,000 people. 61 tanks of various types, including 22 T-34. Precisely due to the successful use of tanks, the brigade held back the offensive of a several times larger Wehrmacht division for more than a week. 
We must pay attention to one more important fact. If the German tank generals were the best in the world in terms of operational and tactical skill at that time, then the same cannot be said about their equipment. Wehrmacht tanks were significantly inferior to the new Soviet machines. The German industry did not have time to saturate the troops with new models, so near Moscow they used a lot of outdated Panzerkampfwagen II, as well as good, but light Czech tanks, which the Germans called Panzerkampfwagen 38T. But even the best German tanks Panzer IV of the early versions at that time lost in basic characteristics to their classmates T-34. For the 41st year, this creation of Kharkiv designers was a formidable machine. And this had its impact in the battle near Moscow. In German memoirists, you can find a lot of memories about how difficult it was for them to meet with T-34. Karl Rupp, Commander Panzerkampfwagen II of the 5th Panzer Division, noted. The most important weapon, an 88mm anti-aircraft gun, was added to 5-8 to eight of our tanks. Only it allowed us to fight back against those impenetrable T-34 that shot our tanks like rabbits. What are we against them with our light guns? Time and time again, the Russians pierced the frontal armor of our tanks. T-34 shells destroyed even the turret of Panzer III and IV. But despite all efforts, Zhukov's troops could not hold the Mosai defense line. By the 18th of October, the Germans broke through it. But by that time, they had already managed to build new defensive lines in front of Moscow as a matter of urgency, which covered the most tank dangerous areas. 70,000 students of Moscow schools and 30,000 factory workers, among whom there were many women, were mobilized for fortification works. One of them, Vera Yevsakova, recalled. The anti-tank ditches were huge, 8 meters wide and 10 meters deep. They were dug mostly by women, it was very hard work. It was necessary to light a fire in order to somehow warm up the frost-bound earth and only then dig. Only the upper, rather thin layer of the earth froze, then it was easier to dig. Having encountered new defensive positions, the German command decided to suspend the offensive. This allowed the troops to rest a bit, draw up reserves and improve supplies. In addition, it was necessary to wait until the ground finally froze. Impenetrable mud will disappear, and mechanized connections will regain their legendary mobility. In the southern direction, on the 29th of October, the advanced units of the 2nd Tank Army reached Tula. Fierce battles broke out near this city and the Wehrmacht stopped advancing. Fundamentally, the situation did not change with the arrival of the forces of the 2nd and 4th Field Armies. Tula ended up in a semi-ring, but the Wehrmacht never achieved more. For the defense of Moscow from the northwestern direction, the Kalininsky Front was created by the Order of the Stake from the 17th of October. It was headed by Ivan Konev. At first glance, such an appointment seemed strange, because not much time passed after the terrible defeat of Konev's troops near Vyazhma, when the general did not come under the tribunal. It is believed that Zhukov's patronage helped Konev not only to survive, but also to stay at the highest levels of the military hierarchy. But let's not forget that the first commander of the Western Front, Dmitro Pavlov, was removed by Stalin's decision after the defeat in the border battles and shot three weeks later. In the catastrophic situation of October, the leader was no longer ready to deal with his defeated generals. Only Zhukov, determined to brutality, remained. Having chosen him for the role of the savior of Moscow, Stalin was ready to agree to any proposals. From the very beginning, the command of the Kalinin Front tried to act actively, even organized a counteroffensive operation with the aim of recapturing Kalinin. Although it was not possible to do this, the German offensive stopped. In November, the situation near Moscow stabilized. Taking advantage of this, the Soviet leadership decided to hold a parade on the 7th of November for the next anniversary of the October Revolution. It became perhaps the most successful Soviet PR campaign in the entire history of the USSR. Even in the West, it was perceived as a demonstration that the Soviets were ready to fight Hitler until the last opportunity. 
Footage from the parade was included in the documentary propaganda film The Defeat of German Troops Near Moscow. Its re-edited version was shown in the USA under the name Moscow Strikes Back. Moscow Strikes Back was shown in order to spread sympathy for the Soviet ally in the States and incite anti-Nazi sentiment. In 1943, the film, apparently for political reasons, was awarded the Oscar Prize in the Best Documentary category. In the future, only three Soviet films will win the most prestigious cinematographic award in the world. War and Peace by Serhii Bondarchuk. Dursu Uzala by Akira Kurosawa, a joint Soviet-Japanese film. Moscow does not believe in tears by Vladimir Menshov. The pause at the front did not only surprise the world with a parade on the snowy red square. Undoubtedly, it benefited the Soviet command as well. New and new echelons with fresh troops arrived from the east. Came help from the UK, and then from the USA. On November 20th, a battalion armed with British tanks appeared near Moscow. By the end of 1941, the USSR had received 187 Matilda II and 249 Valentine. At the final stage of the defensive period of the Battle of Moscow, British vehicles accounted for 30 to 40 percent of medium and heavy tanks. In addition, in December, 16 percent of the fighters that protected the skies of Moscow were Hawker Hurricane and Curtis Tomahawk. And the best way to help history without myths continue to work is Patreon. Now you can see people who are already helping our channel. By becoming a patron of history without myths, you will have the opportunity to get early access to our new videos, receive the autographed book Ukraine, 1918 as a gift, and vote for the selection of topics for the next month. You can also support the channel by making a transfer to a private bank card or our monobank account. Credits and links in this video's description. In the middle of November, the command of the Wehrmacht decided that the conditions were right for a decisive attack on Moscow. On the 15th 16th, the 3rd and 4th tank groups under the command of Generals Hermann Goth and Eric Hepner went on the offensive on the northern flank. On the 18th, Heinz Guderian's 2nd tank group went forward in the south, bypassing Tula. Gunther von Kluge's 4th Field Army had to attack Zhukov's main forces in the center. At first, the offensive in the north developed successfully. On the 27th of November, the Wehrmacht forced the last major water obstacle on the way to the Soviet capital, the Moscow-Volga Canal, and on the 1st of December, the Germans entered Krasnaya Polyana, from where it was 30 kilometers to the Kremlin. The next day, one of the officers of the 2nd Tank Division wrote, from Krasnaya Polyana, you can watch the life of the Russian capital through a telescope. It was the biggest success. Further progress was hindered not only by the resistance of the Red Army. By order of the Stavka, the dams of several reservoirs were blown up and the dumped water turned the area into an impassable one. In the south, the offensive was more difficult. On the 21st of November, the chief of staff of the German ground forces, Franz Halder wrote in his diary. In the afternoon, Gu Derian reported that his troops were out of breath. The second Panzer Army is indeed fighting hard battles on a wide front, but these battles are being successful and our troops are crowding the enemy everywhere. It is to be hoped that the second Panzer Army, despite the arrival of reinforcements to the enemy, fresh Siberian divisions, will still be able to successfully complete the battles. The next day, Guderian's troops captured Stalinogorsk, now Novomoskovsk. This direction was defended by the 50th Army, which they tried to restore as soon as possible after the defeat at Bryansk. It was commanded by Arkady Ermakov for a little over a month. Surrendering a city with such a name could not just pass him by. Zhukov immediately removed the general from his post, and in December he was arrested and brought before a tribunal. Nevertheless, Yermakov was lucky, the trial took place in January 42, when the Red Army was already winning near Moscow, and the sentence was not too harsh, five years in the camps and with the deprivation of rank and awards, but it was only symbolic. The Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR immediately pardoned the general. Behind everything was Stalin, who did not shy away from playing with people's destinies. Guderian advanced a little more and approached Kashira, but his strength was clearly not enough. 
if at the end of September there were more than 400 panzers in the 2nd Tank Division, then before the November offensive there were 150 of them. And now even less. The offensive finally stopped on December 5th. The Germans had to go on the defensive. Not only in the South, but also in other areas. Guderian will write about those days. The attack on Moscow failed. All the sacrifices and efforts of our valiant troops turned out to be in vain. We suffered a serious defeat, which, due to the stubbornness of the high command, led to fatal consequences in the coming weeks. In December, Army Group Center found itself in a difficult situation. Losses in personnel and equipment accumulated. The arrival of replenishments turned out to be critically insufficient, a significant amount of equipment needed repair. There were more and more signs of problems with the supply of the most necessary, especially winter uniforms. The fact is that active hostilities on the Eastern Front were planned to end before winter. Only the occupation troops were to remain there, less than a third of the number of those who actually faced the Russian frosts, when the temperature dropped to minus 30. Accordingly, warm uniforms were prepared for exactly this amount and now there was simply nowhere to get them. And the people were very tired, the morale of the troops fell. This is what Feldfebel Schiff of the 98th Infantry Division testified. Beards that have grown back make us all look like submariners. Our hands are covered with a crust of dirt. When was the last time we washed our uniforms? When did we wash ourselves? It seems that more than one month has passed. The body became stiff from constant lying, twisted in the trenches. You don't feel your hands or feet from the cold. But you feel like lice are eating you. And where are our good comrades who fought side by side with us? Instead, the situation on the Soviet side improved. More than 1,100,000 personnel and almost 800 tanks have already been concentrated in the Moscow region. According to Soviet data, according to these indicators, Army Group Center still prevailed by one and a half times. German researchers prove the opposite. Thus, Henning Turing in the book ALS der Usten Brandt, published in Berlin in the year 2011, indicates that, on the contrary, the ratio of forces was one and a half to one in favor of the Red Army. In the English language literature, there is an opinion about the approximate equality of forces at that time near Moscow. Looks like it's true. Yes, if we take into account von Bock's data that his divisions lost half of their personnel, then in the remainder we will have a little less than a million people, which roughly corresponds to the Soviet group. But it must be emphasized that the Wehrmacht was exhausted while the Soviet fronts largely consisted of fresh units. On December 5th to 6th, the Kalininsky and Western fronts launched a counteroffensive, and on December 12th Zhukov reported to the headquarters. The troops of the front, having exhausted the enemy in previous battles, launched a decisive counteroffensive against his striking flank groups. As a result of the launched offensive, both of these groups were defeated and hastily retreated, abandoning their weaponry and suffering huge losses. The command of the Red Army organized a series of counteroffensive operations that lasted until the spring of 1942. The troops of Army Group Center were pushed back 8,250 kilometers from the capital of the USSR. The number of human victims speaks eloquently about the price of such success. The total losses of the Red Army during the entire battle for Moscow are estimated at 1,800,000 people, and the Wehrmacht, less than 600,000. Many reasons have been given today that led to Germany's first major defeat in World War II. However, they should not be considered the main ones. In the first place, let's put the strategic mistakes of the top leadership of the Reich during the planning of the war against the USSR. Hitler and his closest entourage were very wrong in their assessment of Stalin's ability to mobilize the country's resources for war. In addition, they clearly underestimated factors such as the size of the Soviet Union and the mentality of the majority of its citizens. On December 11, 1941, in the midst of the Soviet counteroffensive, Hitler made another strategic mistake. Germany declared war on the US. That is, only four days have passed since the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which is described in detail in a separate issue of History Without Myths. 
the Fuhrer quickly found a new powerful enemy. By the way, Hitler also incredibly underestimated America. He considered this country corrupted by Jews and liberal politicians and therefore unable to fight. Probably, Hitler expected that in response to his, so to speak, kindness, Japan would declare war on the USSR, and this would prevent the Soviets from transferring troops from the eastern borders to the west. But the pragmatic leadership of the country of the morning sun never took such a step. After all, Japan has already fought in two theaters, China and the Pacific Ocean. Why was the extra trouble needed? Dear viewers, write comments, put likes, share this release on social networks. Thanks again for watching. See you.